So um, I'm going to talk about some topics from uh, the beginning of the class, from Eric's lectures where we started out. In his first lecture, he talked about uh, full implementation in general environments. In the second lecture, um, one thing that he talked about was allocation of a single good with interdependent uh, values. So we're going to return to uh, look at these issues. Uh, we're going to look at them through the perspective that I talked about in my last lecture, some, some type of informational robustness uh, uh, concerns. Okay, so let's review uh, what Eric did. Uh, uh, so for a complete information environment, we say, look, suppose we have a society, a group of people, a set of outcomes, a set of states of the world. Each individual has preferences over these outcomes. And there's complete information, which means like there's common knowledge among the players of what the state of the world is. Okay? In that environment, we say, look, suppose the designer does not know what theta is. Uh, he would like to choose a mechanism that will um, uh, achieve an outcome that he would like. So what's a mechanism? Uh, we specify a set of strategies, or I'll, I'll call them messages uh, sometimes today. <coughs> Uh, and a game form that says as a function of the messages that people announce, what is the outcome that arises? Okay, Eric talked about uh, social choice uh, correspondences. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, social choice functions. There are going to be extensions that we can do to correspondences, but I'm going to just uh, present everything for the case of functions. Okay, we saw in the first lecture that um, it would be nice to be able to do stuff in dominant strategies. Um, the bad news is uh, that you can't if you make some kind of uh, full domain assumption. Uh, give it out of three. Okay, so that's too bad. So then we're going to have to look at Nash equilibrium. Okay, and then we'll say that um, we're implementing the social, function, the social choice function uh, F if uh, in any Nash equilibrium of the mechanism um, I mean, the game that's generated by the mechanism and agent's preferences over outcomes, uh, we look for a Nash equilibrium and we want it to be the case that under this game form, um, in any Nash equilibrium, we will be choosing the outcome that we like. Okay, and there was a monotonicity condition. This one here, I won't pause it. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. So, another typo in my slides, uh, every Nash equilibrium uh, generates this outcome. Otherwise, this would not be an interesting question. So, we're talking full implementation today. I hope I don't keep doing that. All right. Uh, okay, so there's some condition that we'll come back to later, uh, masking monotonicity, which is necessary um, in order to fully implement the social choice function. Uh, it's almost sufficient. Uh, meaning that we can come up with some relatively uh, weak conditions. Eric talked about three players and, and no veto condition. You could come up with other ones um, under which, uh, you know, if you add those in, masculine monotonicity is sufficient. Okay, all day today, I'm going to uh, uh, be doing this. I'm going to be writing almost in inverted commas. There are going to be analogous weak conditions as I move on to incomplete information. I just want to skip those details, okay? They exist, um, but so one can do analogous things to show that the relevant monotonicity conditions are sufficient as well as necessary. I'm just going to um, not focus on that piece of the story, okay? So uh, let's do a little checklist of how we're doing um, in terms of our full implementation results. Uh, uh, what do we get out of this exercise? Well, we get a, a necessary condition for implementation, which is sort of interpretable. Haven't done it, but we can, uh, there's a natural way of understanding what it's saying. Um, we get a proof of sufficiency uh, using some somewhat exotic mechanisms. But as Eric emphasized uh, in his lecture, uh, kind of, you know, it's good to know uh, the limits of what can be done, but then, um, Presumably, the full implementation in practice, the full implementation is going to uh, express itself in practice when we look at some application and we rule out multiple equilibria, okay? Um, you know, in an environment which fits this complete information uh, full implementation story, okay? And there are a bunch of applications that, you know, do answer this question. 
Okay. Now, as um, was uh, um, you know something that came up during the uh, uh, Eric's lecture was this is complete information. What if there's incomplete information about what the set? You know, this was saying that there's complete information among the players of what their preferences are. Okay. When we do partial implementation, that is, does there exist an equilibrium? You know, the whole interesting question is there's incomplete information. So what if we try and look at this full implementation question um, with uh, incomplete information? Okay, so let's describe an incomplete information version of this problem. Okay, so what will we do? Uh, well, we're going to have the same society. Uh, we're going to have the same set of outcomes. Uh, now, though, we're going to have um, incomplete information. So we'll say that for each uh, player i, there'll be some set of types at theta i. Think of everything as finite here. I'm not going to keep saying it. Um, and then uh, agent uh, player i um, is going to have um, some preferences over outcomes uh, where his preferences may depend on his uh, type and actually may also depend on other um, players' types. And uh, an um, example that I'm going to give later is allocating a single good with interdependent values, as I mentioned. There, you know, the idea would be that there's um, some type that I know, some type that other people know, and which outcome we want could depend on both. Okay, so I'm allowing for interdependence here. That's going to be important, as we'll see. Okay. Uh, okay, the, the designer still doesn't know um, what the profile is, the mechanism is still that you're going to have a set of mes messages and you're going to have a game form. Okay? And if we do Bayesian implementation, this would be, you know, there's a literature on this, that the standard uh, next thing to do if we're going to introduce incomplete information is we're going to consider the Bayesian implementation or full implementation problem. Okay? Uh, so if we wanted to do that, how would we continue? Well, we would say, okay, suppose it's the case that there's some common prior over the profile of types of the players. Um, a strategy, of course, in this new induced game is going to be a mapping from types of the players to messages. Uh, we're going to have solution concept. It's going to be the Nash equilibrium of the incomplete information game, or as it would sometimes be called, the Bayes-Nash equilibrium. Okay, so this is just saying you get lots of brackets when you have a game form and then look at people's preferences over outcomes. Okay, but if you just parse all those brackets, the top expression, uh, well, the let's look at the bottom expression. This is just saying what's your ex-ante payoff um, for player I um, uh, if it was the case um, that the actual true profile of types was this um, uh, profile here, player i was type theta i, other players were type theta minus i. Uh, suppose it was the case that the outcomes were determined by the message, outcomes are determined by the messages that get sent. Um, here we're writing, if everybody other than i have type profile theta minus i, they're going to, if they follow their strategies, what's the profile of messages that they send? That's what this object is here. And now if player I um, follows some strategy that might not be his equilibrium strategy, so SI prime that maps theta I to MI, if he followed that strategy instead of his equilibrium <coughs> strategy, uh, this is what the uh, ex-ante payoff of player I would be. Okay, and this condition is then saying that it's an equilibrium because if he follows this strategy in this profile, he doesn't want to deviate to another one, okay? So, Bayes-Nash equilibrium, completely standard. Okay? Yeah, so, yeah, so one can always write it both ways, and um, it's convenient for me. Actually, it doesn't really matter here, but sometimes it's convenient to write it in an ex-ante term. So, this is just saying, I could, this is just my ex-ante payoff from following strategy SI, um, I could deviate to a different rule ex ante, um, and I got to be better off. We could rewrite this by just conditioning on each theta i, yeah. right? And then what has to be the worst uh, set of typos ever, I did the same thing as, uh, as uh, on the last one, okay? 
So the whole point of this exercise is that we're trying to fully implement, okay? So I want to say that in uh, Bayes Nash equilibrium, um, every, not a, every uh, Bayes Nash equilibrium uh, generates an outcome that is consistent with the social choice function, okay? Um, uh, which is then just going to be this statement here. Okay? Sorry about that. <coughs> Everybody <laughs> understands the typo that I did? All right. <coughs> I'm going to guess that it's going to be in the third full implementation question as well, which is a tiny bit of cutting and pasting here. All right. So, um, so there we go. That's the question. Okay, so one thing that we're going to have to satisfy, uh, and that we would have to satisfy, even if we were going to satisfy the partial implementation that I actually described in that typo, okay, so even if we were just trying to find a Bayes Nash equilibrium that delivered the right outcome, we would need Bayesian incentive compatibility. Okay, if we're just looking for a equilibrium, an equilibrium, we're in a revelation principle world, okay, where we know that we can just, without loss of generality, focus on a direct mechanism. We've discussed that enough uh, during the summer school so far. So we could just focus on the case where people uh, truthfully reveal their types and we see if it's incentive compatible um, to truthfully reveal your type. Okay, well that's what this Bayesian incentive compatibility condition says, conditional on your type. If I simply look at the direct mechanism where outcomes were being chosen according to this social choice function that we, were, that we had specified, um, then this would be, um, then this would have to be satisfied for player I. For any of his actual types, theta I, if we look at his utility from telling the truth, that must be more than his utility from telling the lie, misreporting the type, which is what it says here. Okay, so that's one, you know, we didn't have incentive compatibility conditions, if you recall, with complete information, okay, because, um, uh, you know, because there wasn't incomplete information and this issue didn't arise. Uh, there's also going to be an analog, so this is new from the complete information case. There's also going to be analogous incomplete information condition, which is called Bayesian monotonicity. Okay, now what I plan to do here is that it seems a little complicated to state, and what I was going to do is flash it on the screen in order to show you quite how complicated it was. Yes? Just to clarify, uh, suppose that uh, they're all their types are perfectly correlated, so just one state of the world, then Bayesian yeah, if, the, if, if, uh, if that was true, we'd be back in complete information, basically. Because players would, in effect, know what the uh, types of other players were. Okay, so I thought it would be fun to flash it on the screen just to see how complicated it was, but then I was having trouble parsing it, so I thought, no, let's just leave it off. Okay, so there's kind of a complicated condition, which is Bayesian monotonicity, and we get... Uh, so, you know, we get a theorem for this case. So this is a bunch of work in the uh, late 80s, early 90s that followed on from the, the literature on full implementation with complete information. So people wrote down versions of a result like this, okay? So Bayesian is in a compatibility. Uh, this Bayesian monotonicity condition that I didn't tell you are necessary and almost sufficient for F to be implementable in Bayes Nash. Let's go back to our checklist uh, that I put down there for complete information, some things that we might like. Um, so uh, it's slightly complicated, okay, which is, a, you know, the, the monotonicity condition is slightly complicated, a little hard to interpret, so that's not so good. Um, we can do the exact, you know, the exactly analogous thing that we could do with complete information. That is, we could, ch could show that the necessary condition um, is almost sufficient using somewhat exotic mechanisms. Okay. Uh, do we have applications addressing multiple equilibria using simple mechanisms? Well, I put no here. We were discussing it in the taxi coming over here. That might be a slight exaggeration. Did you think of any since then? Yeah. Okay, so he was going to think about it, so none yet. Okay, so I'm okay. Uh, there, are probably, there are probably some, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess the point here is that once we got on to incomplete information, we kind of you know, complete information, we've kind of understood this issue of full implementation. We get on to incomplete information, and we think about the revelation principle, and we do 
uh, and you know, this is 95% uh, uh, of what mechanism design is, is looking at incomplete information in the revelation principle. And for some reason, um, you know, no really very good reason other than the reasons that I just gave, I don't think, um, people just don't do it a lot. So what do we mean here? We mean people construct mechanisms, um, you know, they focus on direct mechanisms um, and, and not look at um, other equilibria of the direct mechanism, which may exist, that's consistent with the revelation principle. Um, or sometimes they'll construct, they'll go beyond constructing the um, direct mechanism. Uh, you know, when you're interested in partial implementation, why do they go beyond that? Well, uh, you know, the direct mechanisms may be a little um, uh, um, abstract. Uh, there are various reasons why you, why you might do it, but the direct mechanisms may be a little abstract, so you'd like to look at indirect implementations of the direct mechanism that are a little bit more um, natural or interesting for various reasons. Okay, maybe used in practice, might be one reason why you look at the indirect mechanisms. Okay, but, but either way, because um, uh, people got tired or something, people don't tend to check for multiple equilibria. Okay, so one reason why you might be interested in getting this general characterization would be because um, uh, um, was, you know, to describe the limit, what Eric was saying, to get the limits of what you can do and then, and it does need a complicated uh, exotic mechanism to prove the general result, but then in particular applications you can, you still want to look for full implementation, uh, but in particular applications it won't, you won't need a mechanism that's quite so complicated. Okay, that's something you'd like to do. Okay, um, another objection that you might have to Bayesian implementation is that it's rather a strong assumption. You might think that the complete information assumption was strong, um, but you might also think that this assumption, that there are these things, these theta i's that are, that are going to be the payoff relevant things that matter, um, you might think that it's rather a strong assumption to assume that there's um, you know, a common knowledge, you know, instead of having common knowledge of preferences, you now have common knowledge of a common prior across those types here. We're kind of used to making that assumption, but it's kind of a strong assumption. Okay, so you might not want to do that. I've been going on about this already, so let me not keep going on about it. Okay, so we might consider an alternative approach where we replace that common prior. There was supposed to be a star here. Okay, we replace the common prior and instead make a different assumption that's richer, that allows for um, more general uh, beliefs and higher order beliefs that the players might have. Okay, so in this context, what, I, what am I going to be doing? I'm going to be assuming a type space where I say player I has some types um, and then a type is going to be a description of, it's going to specify, uh, this is also not quite right, it should specify for each type what theta I it is. We had interdependent values, so actually this isn't a sufficient condition for his preferences, but theta I is part of what his preferences end up being. Okay, so each type is going to specify what is his theta i. So this is like a bigger type that's going to specify beyond his theta i what beliefs are. And we're going to have his beliefs, which are going to specify for each type what are his beliefs over other players. Okay, so we drop the common prior assumption. We drop this um, type connection between theta i, your payoff relevant type, and beliefs that are kind of built in here we allow them to be associated together in an arbitrary way. Okay, and suppose that now, instead of requiring Bayesian implementation on that common prior type space that we described, we're going to require Bayesian implementation, exactly the same thing that we described before, but we're going to require that it's true on all type spaces that we construct this way. Okay, uh, and as I think I argued before, this is a, uh, I want to, um, uh, interpret this as being essentially implementing on the universal type space, that is the space of all beliefs and higher order beliefs. Okay, I'm going to be looking at finite type spaces, but modulo that technicality, you could embed any beliefs and higher order beliefs in here. Okay, so it's relaxing some assumptions, it's incomplete information, but it's relaxing some assumptions. All right, so that's the question that I'm interested in today. I'll call that robust implementation. Okay. Uh, don't know. Uh, 
I, I usually try and call it, inf I've taken to calling it informationally robust, would be a better name. That was in my title. So let's call it informationally robust. Uh, you know, the motivation is that um, I can have a richer set of information structures, so these type spaces, um, and I'm required to implement on all those type spaces. So, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to make sure that you get the right outcome on a richer set of stuff. Well, the way of saying it is, I had this common prior, I, um, I want to test the sensitivity of our conclusions to the fact that there is a common knowledge common prior. It is robust to that assumption of a common knowledge common prior. But I, I'm not going to, it may not be a good name, but that's, that's why. Okay? All right, so I devoted my lecture yesterday to telling you um, how to answer, you know, a, a game theoretic tool to answer this question, okay? That is to say, if I want it to be the case that on all type spaces um, I get a certain outcome in equilibrium, okay, that I was giving it a different name yesterday, it's probably not good, but yesterday I was saying if I want for every expansion that you might do, I get a certain outcome arising in equilibrium, okay? then it's equivalent to uh, 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 being able to implement in some version of rationalizability. Okay, that was, a, that was a punchline of yesterday's talk, if you remember. Okay, so we're going to use it. Okay, so we said that if I want to get this objective, which I'm going to call robust uh, implementation, uh, it's equivalent to... Uh, showing for some definition, some appropriate definition of rationalizability, I was calling it belief-free yesterday. Today I'll drop the belief-free just for um, to save time. Okay, but for the appropriate notion of rationalizability, it'll be the same thing that we're looking for. Okay, yeah. Uh, just on the issue of uh, applications of Bayesian full implementation, I did a Good. Google search. And Excellent. And papers on, on uh, uh, economic environments, ex exchange economies. Okay. And yep. uh, that sort of thing. Okay. So a classic application of full implementation is in exchange economies where we see whether we can implement the set of uh, equilibria. So not no. No was the wrong thing to say. Often. Often. Less often than under complete information. All right. All right. <coughs> okay, just to remind you, or, or to tell you in this context, once we have that um, game theoretic result that I told you about yesterday, what does this robust implementation problem translate into? Okay? Uh, well, we're going to have some rational, ration, you know, appropriate definition of rationalizability, so it's going to be one of those solution concepts that you get by iteratively deleting uh, actions that people might play, okay, in this, in the context of this uh, implementation problem, what would we, we be saying, so if we fix a mechanism, we would be saying, okay, let the set of zeroth level rationalizable actions for a, for a type theta be the set of messages, um, we're going to do some induction, and we're going to say that the kth level rationalizable actions for type theta i is going to be um, the set of messages that have the property that there's some belief that he might have over the um, message profiles of other players and the type profiles. I'll call these, I'll sometimes call these payoff type profiles to distinguish them from these richer type spaces. So there's going to be some belief that he could have that has the property, uh, you know, the belief has the property that it's only going to assign positive probability the combinations of messages of other players and payoff types of other players where the message of Mr. J has not yet been deleted by round K, okay, that's what makes it an inductive iterated deletion procedure, uh, and such that this message MI um, is a best response in this mechanism. Um, so if we do the iterated deletion, everything's finite. There's going to be a limit of what the iterated deletion is. 
So this is going to be the set of messages for Mr. I that are going to be rationalizable in this sense in the, me this, you know, the mechanism is implicit here, the set of rationalizable actions in the fixed mechanism. In um, formula two, I think the first theta I should be a theta minus I, B I of theta minus I. Of Thank you. This is theta minus I. Okay? So now, uh, moment of suspense, have I made the same typo in my third uh, definition of full implementation? No! <laughs> That's exciting. This is the right statement of full implementation in this robust sense. Very exciting. Okay. So what does it say? It says that the social, function, social choice function f is robustly implemented if for any message profile m that is rash where player i's message is rationalizable um, for each um, player given his payoff type, we get the right outcome. This notation may be a little opaque. Um, a better way of saying it, a more complete way of saying it, a less condensed way of saying it, is that if I take a profile of messages Okay, less succinct way of saying it. Okay, so that's our question. <coughs> okay, and we're going to come up with a robust monotonicity condition that I haven't told you, which is going to be necessary and almost sufficient in this case. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to try and um, describe this condition. It's going to be um, uh, it's going to be a little involved. It's going to be a little less involved than the Bayesian monotonicity that I didn't tell you about. Trust me, but it's all it is going to be a little involved. Okay. So, um, in order to uh, parse the condition, let's um, parse uh, mask in monotonicity a little bit, unpack it a little bit, um, in order to. Um, you know, understand the connection with this robust monotonicity condition that I have a little bit. Okay, so here was the mask in monotonicity restricted to social choice functions. Okay, so that, that makes it a little um, easier to state. It makes it a little uh, relatively degenerate, but, um, but this is going to be the relevant starting point for me. Okay, so here's what the condition reduces to for a social choice function. Okay, it's going to say that you've got to get the same outcome um, at theta prime that you have for theta if it's the case that if I start at theta, everything that was worse than, you know, the socially desirable outcome f of theta continues to be worse um, when we switch the state to theta prime, okay, then it has to be the case that these two guys are equal. Sorry, I think I said it the wrong way around. If this condition holds, so going from theta to theta prime, every no weak preference um, is reversed, uh, then it must be the case that f of prime equals f of theta. Okay, now an equivalent way of stating it, which I'll call, uh, you know, the, the um, um, contrapositive, uh, which I'll call the whistleblower version of the condition, uh, would be the following. Okay, it would be saying, social choice function is going to be mask in monotonicity, mask in monotonic, if whenever it's the case that these guys are not equal, then this condition had better fail. Okay, so a way of saying that is that there exists a person I and an outcome B with these two properties. Okay, just mechanically translating uh, the condition. Okay. Um, why might I be, but now let's interpret that condition a little bit, okay? So say it in a, in a long way uh, to give us an interpretation that will be useful for us. 
okay, we, we should say, okay, we can have something that we might call a deception, which is a misreport that you might do. It might be the case that when the true state is theta, the players, instead of reporting uh, that the true state is theta, they um, coordinated on all misreporting that the state is theta prime. Okay? You know, heuristically, this is something that they might do. Uh, now, some deceptions you don't care about. Okay? We could say that they're acceptable if it's the case that the, um, that the outcomes, that the socially desirable outcomes are the same. You don't really care if they misreport, right? Uh, well, what we're going to end up wanting to do is we want to find somebody who's going to report, a whistleblower who's going to report that we um, uh, were uh, on the verge of misreporting our, uh, the true state to be theta prime. Okay? And um, so there's going to be some outcome which is not there in the social choice function that could persuade someone to whistleblow. Okay? However, there's a limit to the set of things that you could do. Um, th there's going to be a limit to the set of rewards that you could give a player for whistleblowing. Okay? Uh, what is that limit? Well, it better not be that I offer him a reward that's going to break down the, uh, the original good equilibrium. Okay? So, uh, uh, so say that something is a reward set for player I. It's the set of things that you could offer the player I when the true state of theta is the set of outcomes B uh, with the property that making B available to him is not going to um, uh, upset the uh, uh, willingness of people to truthfully report that the state is theta. Okay? So this set of possible rewards will be the set of B such that if the true state was theta and if everybody else was truthfully reporting the state to be theta, um, you would prefer what you get to if you were somehow able to induce the outcome B. Okay? So, so this is a set of things that you could give the guy. Okay? And then, I'm just giving a lot of words here that are going to be useful to me. Then we might say that this deception is refutable, meaning that I can find a way in an indirect mechanism to stop this misreport taking place. Okay? It's not going to be a direct mechanism because we're doing full implementation. But um, refutable means I can find a way somehow to, uh, uh, to um, kill this deception. Okay? Well, it better be the case that there is a whistleblower, okay? somebody who's going to say that, that there's, a you know, there's a misreport going on. There's a whistleblower corresponding to that misreport. Um, Mr. I, and there's some outcome that you can give him to induce him to report. Okay? It has to be in this reward set, because otherwise it would be breaking up the good equilibrium. But, um, but if it's in the reward set, it's going to be refuting the deception. If it's the case that by offering player I this outcome B, uh, when people m were otherwise going to be misreporting to theta prime, he does uh, better then, um, I'm sorry, if people were, um, let me say this right way around. Yeah, if the true state is theta prime and people reporting the state to be theta, I can offer a reward to Mr. I to reveal that that was a, a miss, <coughs> a deception. Okay? So my robust monotonicity and, and you know, then masculine monotonicity corresponds to saying that every unacceptable uh, deception is refutable. So this is a gratuitously long way of stating the contrapositive of masculine monotonicity. Okay? Any, any questions about that? Okay, so there are various ways that you could define, um, that one could define robust monotonicity. Uh, I'll give one that is um, uh, th that is going to be the most useful in proving the theorem. We could make it look a little bit less um, um, less complicated. We could go back to the you know I'm going to give an analog of this contrapositive thing. We could go back and give it in this type of form. Um, okay, 
but I'm just going to give a version which is, uh, which is going to work for, for robust monotonicity. <coughs> okay? We can, I want to just follow these steps here. Okay, so a deception with incomplete information is going to be a little more complicated, okay? Uh, but here's how we're going to define it. For each player I, I'm going to say, um, for each type theta I, um, there's going to be a set of things that you uh, could, a set of types that you could report yourself to be. That's going to be the interpretation. Okay, so if player is type theta I, he could report himself to be um, uh, another type, theta i prime, and beta of theta i. Okay, so that's going to mean he could act in the mechanism as if his type was theta i prime. Okay, uh, we're going to be requiring it. This is the, you know, for each theta, we're specifying the set of subsets of theta i, we want it to be non-empty, okay, so that should not have the i subscript here, and I should also say that theta i is going to be an element of this deception, that is to say, you could be reporting more things than the truth, but I'm interested in the case where the truth is included in that, okay, so a missing statement is this part. Okay, is it clear what I'm trying to say here without the typos? All right, so, th so, so this is what for each player I, a set of possible misreports that you could do is, um, I'm, um, uh, and a decep I'm going to use the word deception for a profile of those misreporting, feasible misreporting that you might do. Okay, so that's a deception. We'll say that the deception is acceptable if it's the case that for any profile of misreports that you might do, you'll act when the true profile of um, types is theta. We're going to, this is an intuition, but intuitively, if the true uh, type profile was theta, we're going to act as if the type profile was theta prime, okay, in a way that's consistent with the deception, okay? I'm going to require that however you misreport, it's acceptable if however you misreport, you're still going to get the right outcome, okay? So if the deception is acceptable, if I could reduce re misreports to this uh, extent, we're okay, okay? There's going to be a reward set for player I at type profile, um, theta minus i prime, what's that? That's going to be saying, what's the uh, outcomes that we could conceivably make available to Mr. I when it's the case that other players have reported themselves to be types theta minus i prime. just a definition, but, you know, why might this turn out to be relevant, okay? Well, so here's the formal statement. It's saying, look, um, for any uh, theta um, minus i prime, there's going to be a set of rewards that satisfy the property, this property, let's focus on this property first, that for any theta i prime, it is the case that you strictly prefer the outcome that the social choice function would give you if your true payoff type was theta i prime, and if other players' true payoff types were theta minus i prime, you have to be strictly better off under this one than what you could get um, from outcome B. This should be a B, I'm sorry. Yep. I'm not usually this bad with typos. Jet lag, let's say. All right. So this should be a B. Intuitively, what's this saying? It's saying, well, if other guys are reporting themselves to be theta minus i prime, and they actually are theta minus i prime, 
it had better be that you can't get yourself um, a y that is even weakly better than um, what you could get when your true type is theta i prime from telling the truth. Okay? If there was something even weakly better that you could get, then you might be tempted, you would be tempted, to um, induce this outcome uh, b or y that um, we put here, and this would break down the good outcome. That's the issue. Okay? It wouldn't matter that you did that if, in fact, um, B was the desirable outcome, so we'll allow this possibility as well. Uh, I'm, I'm still not sure why it has to be a strict inequality. If, if, if B uh, were only as good as what you would have if you were truthful, why is it a problem? This is a this is a difference that arises because of rationalizability rather than equilibrium. So I, I, it's a possibility that you could do this, and that would be a problem. Okay, but it's not a problem if, in fact, by um, uh, if you are type theta i double prime, if you're going to get the right thing anyway, that's not a problem. Okay, so that's the stuff that you could imagine making available to Mr. I when other people have reported themselves to be type theta minus I prime. Yeah, yeah, that one of my typos. So Y should be B here. Oh, okay. There is. You can, well, you can have a pen that you can write on it. I just didn't. I should have done that. All right. <clears throat> All right. So that's the reward set. We're going through those steps that I had. Remember those steps that I had to amass monotonicity? Okay. So this is the set of rewards that are available to whistleblowers. Okay. Uh, so now uh, we'll say that the deception is refutable if it's the case that um, there exists somebody, a whistleblower, um, uh, and some uh, misreport that he was thinking of making under this deception, okay, he was thinking he might say theta i prime if his true type was theta i, um, and it has to be the case that for that deception, uh, it has to be the case that whatever it is that other guys report, and for any belief that he has, this is a nasty looking piece of notation, it's supposed to say, for whatever belief that he might have over the set of type profiles of other players who could have misreported to theta minus i prime under this deception. Okay, is that clear? This, the interpretation is that this is misreports that players other than i might make. Um, this is the set of profiles of actual types who might be reporting this under the deception. So what, what is the minus one? It's the inverse. Oh, it's the inverse. Right. It's saying, I should. You probably have a white band, but... Um, so beta j minus i of theta I'm saying that um, if theta j prime is in beta j of theta j I'll say that theta j is in the inverse theta j prime, okay, usual definition of uh, inverse. Okay, so that was a bit of a mouthful. Um, uh, sorry, the, for any such belief, I'm not sure I finished this, there exists an outcome 
um, that is uh, in the reward set with the property that um, you're uh, uh, happier, happy to get outcome Y, you prefer to get outcome Y, you strictly prefer to get outcome Y, um, rather than um, uh, reporting yourself to be type theta I prime for, for um, <coughs> any theta minus I um, that, sorry, for this particular theta I that you might have reported yourself to be theta I prime. Sorry, I didn't say that quite right. Heuristically, we've got a whistleblower. He's thinking of reporting theta I prime when he's actually type theta I. Okay, I want to discourage him from doing it. So it has to be the case that if he is truly theta I and he's misreporting himself to be theta I prime, it has to be the case that um, for this belief that he has over the other guys, uh, true types, when they're reporting themselves to be theta minus i, it has to be the case that he prefers y. Okay? And this has to be true. I have to be able to find, in order to um, show that theta i won't report himself to be type theta i prime, okay? um, then it had better be the case that, um, uh, that for every theta minus i prime and every ci, um, I can find such a y. Why? Because in this notion of rationalizability, uh, he might be, have a dogmatic belief that the other guys are going to send this message, and he might believe, he might have a certain probability distribution over what are the actual types of the players who are sending this message, and if we're going to delete theta minus theta i prime, it had better be the case that for all of those, we can offer him a reward. Okay, and now we're done. The social choice function satisfies robust monotonicity if every uh, unacceptable deviation is uh, refutable. Yep? The quantifier is there exists i, theta i, and theta i prime. Mm -hmm. There exists that triple. Mm -hmm. uh, it's saying there exists this profile with the restriction that this is true. Yep. Sorry, at the back. Uh, it's a little complicated. So the results are definitely less satisfactory with social choice consequences. Yep? Uh, so uh, this is a condition that uh, allows us to move out some absurd impact, right? It doesn't move out deviations from the process that we do. It moves out some of that, some of that, right? Or does it somehow move out? No, it's ruling out the, ex intuitively, it's ruling out the existence of bad equilibria. Yeah. But since the set of equilibria on all type spaces is equivalent to rationalizability, um, it's saying that if I had a deception, um, well, you'll, you'll see. I mean, I basically told you the proof. Uh, that is, I've interpreted in such a way that it's kind of intuitive, but let's just do the last, hopefully, it's clear what the next steps would be, but let's write it down. Okay, so <coughs> I'm proving the necessity of robust monotonicity for um, uh, robust implementation. Okay, uh, so all we're going to do is we're going to look at the set of rationalizable outcomes uh, as a um, deception. Okay, that is to say, if we look at these rationalizable outcomes, what we get from this iterated deletion, that is a um, that is a deception, in the sense that we will have for each um, uh, payoff type 
there will be a set of messages that that payoff type might take. Okay, so I'm going to apply this definition to those sets of rationalizable outcomes. Okay, so if the rationalizable, if the, let's call it the deception of rationalizability, okay, um, is acceptable, okay, so those deviations aren't a problem, you still get um, the outcome, that the socially desirable outcome, um, then um, we would get full implementation. Okay, so, so we don't need, um, yeah. Okay, if it was the case that this was not acceptable, and if it was the case that there existed a message that gave rise, that gave rise to an outcome, some outcome like this, that was not in the reward set, as we defined, for some messages that were rationalizable um, for players other than I, uh, yes, okay, then it would be the case that F was not robustly implementable, okay, for this reason that I just gave, okay, um, it would be the case that, um, you know, player could, uh, uh, if his true type was theta i prime, he would be able to induce an outcome by sending message mi when the other guys were sending messages theta minus i prime. He would be able to send a message that got us to an outcome that was not okay. Okay. I'm not quite sure why your, your conclusion there is F is not robustly implementable. Aren't you just showing that F is not implemented by G? It could be implemented by something else. Yes, <coughs> exactly right. Okay, so if there existed a mechanism, it would. Um, uh, yes, this property would have to hold under that mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would also have to be true under that mechanism, okay, that if it was not acceptable, okay, there would have to be something, this was the rationalizable set, okay, we were looking at the rationalizable set here, okay, and if the rationalizable set is not acceptable, okay, then it better be the case that I could delete something further. This is a candidate rationalizable set. So there must exist a whistleblower and a misreport that he might make, uh, you know, with this property that for all these basically conjectures that he might have, okay, so he might be dogmatically believe that they're going to send this message and you have beliefs over the set of guys that might do it. It has to be the case that we can find a message that he would send, okay, that is strictly preferred by him to this outcome here, okay? Because this is the report that's being sent by the other players, okay? Uh, this is the misreport that you're thinking about making, so it had better be the case that um, if this mechanism was going to be um, robustly implementing, it had better be the case that this property is true, okay? But um, steps one and two imply that R infinity, if it was the case that the mechanism um, uh, satisfied two and three, then R infinity. That is, you can't simultaneously um, satisfy the conditions that are satisfied here by monotonicity. Okay? So we've shown that if R is not acceptable, then it must be the case that our infinity is refutable, which is exactly the robust monotonicity condition that we wanted to establish. Okay? So that's, yeah. In addition to the true one. Okay, 
So the idea here is the same as what it is in um, mask and monotonicity under full implementation, which is that what we're looking for here is, you know, the, the definition of full implementation. We're quantifying over all possible mechanisms, um, which is a nasty thing to do. So what we're going to try and do instead is um, come up with conditions which are expressed in terms of the underlying social choice function. Okay, so that's what we did here. Okay, so that's the nature of what the robust monotonicity condition is. And once you have the robust monotonicity condition, you show that there's a, um, you know, there's a contradiction. If robust monotonicity failed, then you are able to fully implement. Okay, now your question was why? Yeah, so what we're trying to do here is we're saying what's properties of an abstract um, deception, what I called a deception, and the robust monotonicity condition was telling you um, some properties that arbitrary deceptions have to satisfy, okay? And then we're saying, okay, this, any mechanism, uh, any fixed mechanism is going to have a set of rationalizable outcomes. I can deduce some properties plugging the set of rationalizable outcomes into the um, uh, definition of robust monotonicity, and I can verify that Ro robust. Okay, let's, yep. Uh, well, the most significant way in which I'm using it is that, you know, this whole notion of deception um, is um, building in the idea that, you know, we're not imposing beliefs that you have about other players' types and messages that you're sending beyond saying that they're in a certain set. Okay, so I would, I would say that the most basic way in which we're, um, uh, in which this reflects rationalizability is that, um, uh, you know, the object that we're looking at is these deceptions, which are the relevant notion for um, rationalizability. And then when we look at what the robust monotonicity condition says, it has these quantifiers you know, these quantifiers here saying that you have to be able to let the whistleblower uh, get rid of some deception, it has to be true for all beliefs and all reports that other people make. That's saying that it has to work for any, that captures the idea that I have to be able to rule something out for every belief that he has, which is kind of a property of rationalizability. And we're using it in some more minor ways, like where we get strictness instead of weak conditions. No, I would say the opposite. That rationalizability is allowing, is putting no restrictions on players' beliefs, on your beliefs about other players, beyond the fact you're putting no restrictions on their beliefs about other people's payoff types or other people's um, messages beyond the fact that they're rationalizable. Okay, and that's built into this definition here where we're saying we're putting no restrictions on the um, messages that they send or the types that they implicitly misreport themselves to be and the set of what their true types are, so you're allowing for any belief over what their true types theta minus i are, the only restriction that you're imposing is that players, other players are choosing something that is rationalizable. And that's built in to this definition here. Okay, so the combination of these two things, this is good, uh, it's the definition of these two things that builds in the idea that any belief is possible, consistent with rationalizability, and that's 
the defining feature of this definition of rationalizability. R infinity is the set of rationalizable, oh, I'm sorry, it should be indexed by what the set of types are. Well, yes. Right, but my question is then, um, so that, that should be a set of or, or report messages in a mechanism. Yeah, what I'm missing here is an index. It is a set of messages, absolutely. Absolutely. So this was another typo, which is that Ri should be, uh, this should be indexed by theta. And then it's the same type of object. Uh, this is saying that it, it is the case that if you were convinced that the other guys were going to send message theta minus i prime, and if you had this belief ci over what other guys' types are, it would be the case that this y would be, um, it would be better off for you to send y if your actual type was theta i and you were misreporting yourself to be theta i prime. So hopefully that's what this says. It says if you're, you have this belief over what the true types of the other player are, but you're convinced that they're reporting themselves to be types theta minus i prime, and your actual type is theta i, and you're misreporting yourself to be theta i prime, this is what your utility would be. You're better off by whistleblowing if you can get the outcome y. That's the, that's the intuition here. So you can misreport only by a rationalizable uh, when, I, when we apply this, when we use this in a proof, then we're, you know, our premise, we're saying, suppose we set the deception equal to the set of rationalizable outcomes, so then this will be saying yes for rationalizable if you're saying rationalizable things. Yep. That is what we're saying, because we, um, we have during this in I that for every theta negative I prime should be more that like for every theta prime there exists an I and some like theta I double prime such that like here we're saying there has to be a whistleblower such that for every exception that other people make. Uh, no, I think if I understand the question correctly, the answer is I have to delete this misreport of Mr. I and I have to do it for every belief that we have and therefore I have to quantify over every misreport. It's not for a fixed set of misreports that people are doing. That's kind of the idea. All right. <coughs> um, so uh, let me move on a tiny bit faster. You can verify. Uh, so there's an important property, which is ex post incentive compatibility, which is an analog of Bayesian uh, incentive compatibility that Eric mentioned in lecture two. 
Okay, so ex post incentive compatibility is the idea that under this social choice function, uh, it is the case um, that uh, you do not want to misreport your type from theta i to theta i prime. Okay, uh, this is this incentive constraint says that you never want to do that, whatever the uh, uh, whenever the types of the other player are theta minus i, and they truthfully report themselves to be type theta minus i. Okay, that's ex post incentive compatibility. Okay, and I'm going to be interested in a strict version of that. Okay, um, so this is going to be the relevant incentive compatibility condition for this problem that would have to hold for partial implementation. Okay, we can go through that argument uh, if you wanted to. Okay, an observation that I want to make is that robust monotonicity <coughs> implies ex post incentive compatibility, in fact, a strict version of that. So for the Bayesian results, we had sort of these two conditions. The robust monotonicity has it built in. How to see that, I'm not going to go through it. Just consider the deception where everybody tells the truth except that there's exactly one misreport. There's exactly um, one player and one misreport, you know, what that that player might send, okay? And then you apply the definition and you have strict ex post incentive compatibility, okay? In private value environments, then we're basically crossing this out, okay? So then we don't need to say anything about truth-telling. We can just have... Um, Basically, theta minus i is the reports that you're making. Uh, and then strict ex post incentive compatibility will reduce the strict dominant strategies incentive compatibility. Okay? But if you have strict dominant strategies incentive compatibility, it's kind of clear that you can have full implementation. Okay? You're, you're going to report your, your payoff type truthfully. Okay? So that tells us something interesting which is that it tells us that to the extent that robust monotonicity goes beyond strict epic, okay, we've said that robust monotonicity implies strict epic, there's some strengthening of strict epic implicit in the definition of robust monotonicity, um, but if there's, um, uh, if there's private values, there is no extension, so this suggests the intuition that the extension from strict epic to robust monotonicity must have something to do with the degree of interdependence. Okay, more interdependence makes the full implementation problem harder. Okay, so I'm going to give an example illustrating the uh, um, f robust full implementation um, that's going to make this point clearer. Okay, but let's just do our checklist. Okay, uh, what was it that we're looking for? Um, interpretable necessary condition, eh, well, it was a little involved, okay, but it's better than Bayesian monotonicity that I didn't show you, okay? Uh, um, but it does have an interpretation that I just described to you and that we could elaborate on, which is that robust monotonicity condition can be interpreted as saying there's not too much uh, interdependence, okay? Um, uh, so we have the same um, converse, type of converse result. Okay, and we want to look at um, uh, removing multiple equilibria using simpler mechanisms. Well, that's the example that I'm about to give. Okay, and it's a pretty canonical problem that Eric talked about in the second lecture, which is implementation of, you know, efficiently allocating a single good. He showed that there was an equilibrium, an ex post equilibrium, in fact, that would implement the efficient allocation and, and we'll be saying some limitations if you want full implementation, okay? So, uh, and I'm just gonna do an example. Um, so let's consider the problem of, let's do private values first. Let's consider the problem of allocating a good with private values, let's say in the interval zero, one, okay? Uh, you might think the second price auction is a good way of doing this, a well-known way of getting the uh, efficient outcome. Um, slight problem is that it does it only in weakly dominated strategies, okay, and that gives rise to lots of equilibria. Let me just do a tweak, a little ad hoc tweak to get um, strict, to, to, to tweak the second price auction to get strict um, dominant strategies. Okay, here's how we could do it. 
we could just say, let's run the second price auction with probability 1 minus epsilon. Okay, so the usual second price auction. Okay, and let's tweak it and just say that with epsilon probability, we'll do some screening mechanism that will give players an ins a strict incentive to truthfully report their types. Okay, so with probability epsilon, suppose you uniformly randomly picked a player. So with probability 1 over n, you picked each player, and you allocate the good to him with probability uh, B, bi. Remember, that was an I normalize things, so your type or bids is a number between 0 and 1. Okay? And I allocate it to him with probability bi, conditional on i being chosen, and uh, if I don't allocate it, it to him, I throw it away. Okay? And then I ask him to pay uh, uh, half bi, okay, half his bid, and you can check, I won't go through the algebra, you can check that this is a screening mechanism that will give him a strict incentive to truthfully report his type. Okay, I want to think about single good, we could do this with other problems. I want to think about single good allocation, so think of this as just a tweak to get full implementation in our canonical um, uh, one, uh, you know, allocating a single good. Okay, so with this tweak, truth-telling in the second price auction is not merely a dominant strategy, it is actually a strictly dominant strategy. Okay, so that's good. And that obviously means that this allocation, which is almost efficient, uh, is robustly implemented. There's private values here. So that's good. Okay, so let's add interdependence as values. Okay, so let's tweak the problem. So suppose Mr. I has a payoff type. Uh, now it's not his value, it's a payoff type, theta I. And suppose the agent I's value is now his payoff type plus gamma times the types of others. Okay, so this is the simplest example that one can think of that is used in this literature. Eric used it just to illustrate some stuff. Okay, so this is the simplest example that we can think of to illustrate uh, interdependent values. Okay, and if you assume that gamma is less than one, then you have the relevant um, single crossing condition that I care more about my type than other people care about my type. Okay? Uh, so we could do the extension that Eric talked about in the second lecture. Okay? So here's the extension applied to this toy example. The extended second price auction, which we're going to do with probability 1 minus epsilon, we're going to allocate the good to the highest bidder, so you're, you're just going to bid. Um, we're going to make you pay uh, this payment uh, we're going to allocate the good to the highest bidder. We're going to make you make this payment. Let me explain that payment in a second. Uh, but we'll do this strict screening mechanism uh, as well with probability epsilon, just to get the strictness. Probability epsilon will do this same thing that we did before. Um, and it's only with probability bi that individual i gets the object. And then he has to make some payment here. Okay, so in the extended second price auction, this is what Eric said in the second lecture. The key thing about the extended second price auction is that as in the original second price auction, the winner's payment is independent of his bid. If he does win, it's independent of his bid, right? BI doesn't appear in here. And the payment that he makes corresponds to his willingness to pay at the lowest bid at which he would win. Okay, so in this case, um, this is the lowest bid um, at which he would win, and his willingness to pay here, if you thought other people were bidding truthfully, then this is the amount that you would want to pay. Okay? And you can check also that if I thought other people were bidding truthfully, this is the screening mechanism that would give you a strict incentive to tell the truth. Okay? Is it clear? All right, so we have some good news and some bad news. Okay, the good news is that truth-telling is now a strict ex post equilibrium. Okay, why is it? It's an ex post equilibrium of the extended second price auction, as we just saw, and as Eric explained more generally in, um, uh, in the second lecture. Okay, and we, we added in this screening tweak that gives you a strict incentive. So it is a strict ex post equilibrium uh, of this mechanism. Okay? Of this direct mechanism, 
I've put direct in inverted commas here. Okay, why did I put it in inverted commas? Well, just to be clear, you have these payoff types, theta i, and the robust implementation story is we're, you know, we're allowing for lots of type spaces with lots of beliefs and higher order beliefs. Okay? So this is not merely a direct mechanism. It's a mechanism where you're just reporting this payoff type. So you're not reporting anything about your beliefs and higher order beliefs, which are floating around in the background in this definition. Okay? Um, good, but truth-telling is a strict exposed equilibrium. Okay, but unfortunately, this does not imply robust implementation. Okay, we kind of saw that because we said that there was an ex post incentive compatibility condition and robust monotonicity was going to require a little bit more. Okay, so what can we say about this? Okay, well, the first observation that we can make is that the direct mechanism that I just told you is in fact going to give us the... Um, uh, almost efficient outcome if this interdependence is not too large. What's not too large? It's this guy here. Okay, now if n was equal to 2, this would be saying gamma was less than 1, okay, which is the condition that we needed anyway to get ex post incentive compatibility. Okay, but if there are many players, this is shrinking the interdependence that you could have. Okay, so that's good. How do we know that that's the case? Easy because we um, invested in the last lecture. I said that we were going to invest for this lecture, okay? So here's some payoff to our investment. If I think about this direct mechanism, okay, it has the feature that if I write bi would have been better notation here. Um, well, it would be better notation in the context of this lecture, but in the last lecture, we called it ai. Okay, in this lecture, your best response is to bid your true type Okay, as long as you think other people are reporting truthfully. But to the extent that they're um, choosing an action or a bid that is higher than their type, that is, they're misreporting upwards, then you have an incentive to misreport downwards. Okay, why? Because if they're misreporting upwards, you're going to be charged more money if you win the good, so you want to win the good less often. Okay, what's the degree to which you want to do that? Uh, gamma, just from those payoffs. Very simple. Okay? But we proved in the last lecture that there's a unique truth-telling rationalizable outcome in this um, linear best response game. Okay? I put truth-telling in inverted commas because last lecture it was just an action. Okay? But now actions correspond to bids and it has this truth-telling interpretation. Okay? So what have we done? We've constructed a mechanism, which is this sort of super direct mechanism, because you just report your payoff types, that gives you this, um, this nice allocation. Okay, bad news is that if gamma is bigger than 1 over n minus 1, there is no mechanism that will implement this outcome. Okay? Uh, good. So... We're a little bit of the way there because we proved in the last lecture that that particular mechanism won't implement this allocation. Okay? Uh, of course, I made a stronger claim uh, here, but in that particular mechanism, it won't work uh, exactly because there were many rationalizable outcomes, and you know we know that that's the relevant thing in that mechanism. Okay? But in fact, no other mechanism would work either. Okay? And the reason I know no other mechanism uh, can work either is that we can verify the failure of robust monotonicity. Okay? Rather than do that, and actually this is probably going to be a general rule in applications, it, you can use the condition, but we can also come up with some direct ad hoc argument to show that there are other bad equilibria. Okay? What would be... Um, so here's an ad hoc argument. Let's focus on the case where gamma is more than or equal to zero. Notice I didn't rule out the possibility that it was negative, but let's focus on the case where it's more than or equal to zero. Uh, it's enough for me to just construct a single type space where I know that no mechanism is going to work. Okay? Then I can quantify across all mechanisms, and of course it's not going to work. 
Well, here's a, and you know, I get to pick. I got a lot of degrees of freedom here. I can pick a really uh, unfortunate type space. Okay. So here's the extreme type space that I'm going to construct. Consider a type space where whenever a player has payoff type theta i, he has some kind of extreme dogmatic beliefs, which is that he believes that each other player has a certain payoff type. This payoff type here. Okay, now the key thing to observe about this is that he's assuming some negative correlation in payoff types. When his payoff type is higher, he just happens to think that other guys' payoff types are lower. Okay? We, we're not imposing any restrictions on belief, so there's no reason why you might not have this belief. Okay? Now, um, could he have such beliefs? Well, we had a bounded set of types, um, so it had better be the case that this falls in the interval 0, 1. Okay? Well, you can check that it falls in, we know that it falls in the interval 0, 1, but only because gamma is at least 1 over n minus 1. Okay? That's what you need to make this true, because 1 over n minus 1 uh, means that this guy is smaller than 1, which means, right, you can check that. All right, but what did I do? I wrote down a formula here. I wrote down a formula precisely so that if I said, what's his expected valuation of the good when his type is theta i, okay, um, then uh, his expected value of the object is going to be the same thing. Okay, so independent of his payoff type, he has a certain valuation of the object. Okay, so in any mechanism that I write down, there will be a pooling equilibrium where given his payoff type on that type space, on this wacky type space, there will be a pooling equilibrium where every one of his types behaves in the same way because he expects other players to behave in the same way and conditional on them behaving in the same way, the only thing that he cares about is his expected value. Okay? That's basically it. Any questions about that? But, you know, hopefully it fits this criterion that it's a... Uh, uh, it's an application, kind of canonical application, where we, can get ap where we can get action out of this robust uh, implementation notion. Um, uh, and, you know, in the application, we may not want to use the robust monotonicity condition uh, explicitly because we can come up with a cute ad hoc argument here. But, the, uh, but a nice thing is that the, um, this application uh, inherits, you know, the robust monotonicity already captures this intuition that too much uh, interdependence is what's going to make it impossible uh, to do the robust implementation, even if you can do partial implementation. Okay? And actually, I just conclude by saying, number one, the argument of that example generalizes to a fairly rich environment. Okay? Uh, so if you consider an environment where players' preferences, there's a profile of other players' types, but suppose that their preferences depend on some statistic of, of uh, everybody's payoff types. There's a vector, theta 1 to theta i. Suppose there's some way of aggregating them into a single number. In the example, it was theta i plus gamma, the sum of theta j. But more generally, I could come up with one sufficient statistic. And if it was the case that my preferences depend on the allocation the outcome A, and that sufficient statistic, and there's some single crossing property with respect to that statistic, then we can do the same thing that I um, did in the example. So uh, Eric gave generalizations um, of interdependence, and I could do this with those generalizations of interdependence um, using this. Okay? And we're going to inherit those properties of the example, that robust implementation uh, is possible if and only if it's possible in the payoff type direct mechanism. Okay, so in that sense, this isn't the revelation principle for the reasons that I gave you, but there is a relatively simple mechanism um, that's always going to be able to implement if it's possible to do so. And robust implementation in this class of environments is going to have some type of characterization, which is equivalent to robust monotonicity, but adapted to this more specialized environment. And again, 
it has this flavor that the relevant condition is going to correspond to not too much interdependence. Okay, one last remark is, is that my last comment last time, so a nice parallel, parallelism here, uh, my last remark last time, I made a distinction between the common prior case and the non-common prior case. We've been talking all the time about the uh, common prior case, the, the non-common prior case here. Okay, in particular, this wacky type space that we constructed was not a common prior type space by a long way. Okay? Um, so, uh, but what would have happened if we had imposed the common prior type space? Okay? Well, um, if I had negative interdependence, Okay, the case that we weren't motivated by, I guess, when gamma is less than or equal to zero. Okay, that's actually the case. We talked about this distinction last time. That's actually the case when there are strategic complementarities. Okay, and imposing the common prior assumption does not make it any easier to robustly implement. Okay? You restrict the set of type space. So in principle, it's easier. But because you have strategic complementarities, we argued actually doesn't make any difference. Okay, on the other hand, if gamma is more than or equal to zero, then it makes things easier. Okay, there are strategic substitutes, and in fact, uh, we established that in the example that we talked about, that um, uh, there will in fact be robust implementation in that linear example under the common prior. Okay, so in the example, you might say, you know, like many results in economics, um, it matters whether you assume the common prior or not. Okay, now the bad news is, yeah. So, so with common prior and gamma greater than zero, there's no restriction on gamma other than it that would be less than one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So that's good. Yep. Um, the bad news, though, is that. Um, Unfortunately, that's an entirely ad hoc, that's an entirely special argument. So I don't know, you know, the, the rationalizability results, I can really consider a general setting where, where there are natural analogs of that example. I have no idea in this case. All right, that's what I want. Sorry, let me say one more thing, which is that I don't know anything about what happens in that case in general. A fine problem for you to uh, find out what happens in that case. <coughs> yep. There is, um, and um, you're testing my memory a tiny <laughs> bit. Um, I, I, I'm sure that we make the argument that they're better at results, actually. That is, the bits that you have to add are a little bit better because there's this extra structure. So I think that I don't need the three-player restriction. I mean, you don't need that with complete information e either, but you get a very complicated condition and that the extra bit that you have to impose uh, is basically a relatively weak, no complete indifference condition. Um, but I, I would have to look it up more. But you know, the spirit <laughs> is the same, that you have to add a little bit. Yeah. Um, if I understand correctly, we have seen like, basically like two extremes on the implementation problem with respect to this uh, uh, information or what we assume about the information and the needs of players. And I was wondering if Another excellent research topic. <laughs> so I agree that that's a natural thing to do. Uh, people have done some things. One intuitive thing, just in the framework that I was describing, is you know take a Bayesian prior, but just allow you to have interim beliefs in some neighborhood. Well, that's what you just said. But it's very natural to formalize a notion of local 
robustness of you know like that and you know there are results in between actually acute result is, uh, example is that if I have some interval some delta some measure of how much beliefs can vary and I look at that example that I had before then there's some condition that says gamma delta has to be less than or equal to 1 over n minus 1. That may be the wrong way around, but you know, you, you can... People have looked at special cases of that, but on the whole, it's an open question and I think a good one. <coughs> No, it's the other way that there's an the issue. So the universal, it's a property of the universal type space that I can embed any type space within it as a subset. So it's certainly the case that if you can implement on the, um, on the universal type space, you can robustly implement in this type space that I described. Um, the, uh, you know, I wrote down arguments for actually some of these arguments I can do with compact type spaces, or, but finite type spaces is okay. Um, there are some technical issues. And, you know, I can get arbitrary beliefs and higher order beliefs using countable type space. So there are some technical issues. But so, so, so the other way around is where they could have It could conceivably be the case that you could construct some, it could be implementable on every finite <coughs> or compact type space, but you could come up with some um, countable uh, or otherwise problematic type space on which it can't be implemented. Uh, there, there are examples of that? No, absolutely not. <laughs> and I <laughs> conjecture that if there were, they would be silly technical examples. But that's the, yeah. Just one follow-up question. Um, are there any analogous results for uh, robust implementation with a common prior but you vary the information structure? Do you mean that robust implementation or robust That's what it is. I thought this is uh, the general monophysicity as the necessary condition. I thought what oh. was uh, Yeah, no, absolutely. So, yeah, I said, this is, just re this is just repeating what I said, which is that the arguments are special. It might be interesting to ask if one could do something generally. Huh. It might involve some monotonicity condition right, right. Um, that... Uh, that allows for lots of type spaces but has the common prior built in. It's absolutely not obvious to me how you would do that, but one could look for that. <coughs> All right, thank you. <coughs>